<laughs> well, welcome everyone here in Zurich, and welcome as well to those who are watching us online to our closing keynote lecture for the conference Listening In. Uh, my name is Sol Perez Martinez, as many in the room know already, and I am a member of the Scientific and Organization Committee of this conference. After three days of enriching conversation and papers, it is my absolute pleasure and honor uh, to be on the stage today to welcome Professor Jane Rendell as our closing keynote speaker. Jane Rendell is Professor of Critical Spatial Practice at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London, where I had the opportunity and good luck to have her as my supervisor, as many other people in the room have also had that pleasure. <laughs> the work of Professor Rendell is a cornerstone for critical and feminist research in architecture, introducing to the practice and theory of architecture the concepts of critical spatial practice and site writing through her writings and educational practice. With her solo authored books, 10 co-edited collections, and more than 100 articles, she has expanded our understanding of architecture by weaving in art, feminism, history, and psychoanalysis. Her books include The Architecture of Psychoanalysis from 2017, The Fictionella Silver from 2016, Side Writing of 2010, and Art and Architecture from 26, 2006. Sorry. Jane has also co-edited influential collections like the reader Gender, Space and Architecture from 1999 with Barbara Panner and Ian Borden, which introduced to architecture so many foundational texts and ideas for feminist research. More recent collections include Critical Architecture from 2007 and Reactivating the Social Condenser from 2017. Ethics is a key area of research for Professor Rendell today and she is currently the director of the Bartlett's Ethic Commission at UCL. With Dr. David Roberts, they have developed a helpful online toolkit for ethics and architectural research called Practicing Ethics. And with Dr. Yael Padan, they have analyzed the ethics of research practice as part of the Knowledge in Action for Urban Equality Research Project. At the Bartlett, she co-founded and teaches at the MA Situated Practice, as well as the MA Architectural History, where I met her more than 10 years ago. This afternoon, we're looking forward to hearing Jane's lecture, where she will return to her inspiring first book, The Pursuit of Pleasure, Gender, Space and Architecture in Regency London, published first in 2002. On the occasion of this conference, um, she's listening to new voices between the lines of what she wrote more than 20 years ago in her talk titled, Listen Again, Returning to the Pursuit of Pleasure. Please join me in giving a warm, warm welcome to Professor Jane Randall. Putting it on, I think, and then this bit. Is that working okay? Yeah? Is that on now? Yes. Yeah? Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for that lovely introduction, Sol. And... Um, Massive thank you to, to Anne, to Sol, to Sigrid, to Alexandra, to Noel, to Martin, to all the amazing organizing team, Nikos, um, and all the supporters um, for this incredible conference, really. Um, and to all the speakers, um, very sorry to those who were on the first session this morning, but I was up very late last night adjusting my paper and um, slept through the alarm. But apart from those papers, I think I heard everything else and this amazing panel now, which I think really touches on where I get to in the end of, of my talk today. Um, it's been a really special conference, and I think it really has kind of coined a new term I think wower has to be uh, wow in the feminine. There's no doubt for me. So it's been a wower uh, conference. Um, so thank you. Um, so uh, about a year ago, I think, being a very organized team, um, Anne and Sol, uh, I opened my email to find a lovely invitation to come and talk at this conference. And um, the suggestion was that I return to the pursuit of pleasure. And strangely enough, that converged with an interest that I already had in, in doing that. I'd 
I won't go into all the, the different anecdotes around this, but it, it really seemed like time to, to go back and relook at that book. So I'm very, very grateful for the prompt, um, and I really hope I can do justice to the promise of, of such a return. So slightly different title from the ab abstract. I think it is just a return, return. So in this talk, I will return to an earlier piece of research, The Pursuit of Pleasure, that was published in 2002, to listen again to who and what was not heard the first time around. In the 1990s, I was inspired by the exciting methodological possibilities that French feminist theory opened up for architectural history, concerning rethinking our objects of study, modes of interpretation, and styles of writing. And in my own research, Luce Irigaray's 1977 essay, Women on the Market, that was translated into English in 1985 and published in the collection of essays, This Sex Which Is Not One, suggested to me ways of understanding how visual and spatial practices of rambling, specifically consuming, display and exchanging in London's West End in the early 19th century, were gendered. More recently, I've become fascinated with how Tina Kempt has suggested listening to, rather than looking at, visual evidence, and how, through her critical fabulation, Sadia Hartman has created possibilities for black women obscured from history to become present. In the pursuit of pleasure, I sought to understand architectural experiences historically, focusing on gendered and classed representations, while issues of race remained relatively unseen and unheard. Sara Ahmed makes clear that, depending on which way one turns, different worlds might even come into view. So I hope that this return to the ramble will, as Karen Barad has expressed it, not be returning as in reflecting on or going back to a past that was, but returning as in turning it over and over again. Aiming to put into practice the potential for turning, returning and returning, for listening and for critical fabulation, today's return to the pursuit of pleasure will listen to a range of women, Lucy Gary and beyond, including historical women I hardly noticed the first time around and feminist theorists, historians writing today. Structured into three parts, So first, turn, return, and return. Second, listening. And third, critical fabulation. Each of those parts is in turn composed into three voices. In each one, I begin by reading the words of a contemporary feminist historian theorist. I follow this by reading part of my own pursuit of pleasure. And then I end by returning the implications that this particular feminist historian theorist offers to my earlier arguments. So we begin with turn, return, return. Sarah Ahmed begins her 2006 book, Queer Phenomenology, Orientations, Objects, Others, with the following thoughts on turning. What does it mean to be orientated? This book begins with the question of orientation, of how it is that we come to find a way in a world that acquires new shapes, depending on which way we turn. If we know where we are when we turn this way or that way, then we are orientated. We have our bearings. We know what to do to get to this place or to that place. To be orientated is also to be turned toward certain objects, those that help us to find our way. What difference does it make what we are orientated toward? And a little later, she makes this point on returning, no hyphen. The promise of interdisciplinary scholarship is that the failure to return texts to their histories will do something. Of course, not all failures are creative. If we don't take care with the texts we read, if we don't pay attention, then the failure to read them properly won't do very much at all. Taking care involves work, and it's work we must do if we're to create something other than another point on line. 
We must remember that to not return still requires the act of following. We have to go with something if we're to depart from that thing. The following takes us in a different direction as we keep noticing other points. And in her 2014 article, Diffracting Diffraction, Cutting Together Apart, Karen Barad defines a distinction between return and return, one with, the other without, a hyphen. She writes, Diffraction owes as much to a thick legacy of feminist theorizing about difference as it does to physics. And as such, I want to begin by returning, not by returning, as in reflecting on or going back to a past that was, but returning, as in turning it over and over again, iteratively, interacting, redifracting, diffracting anew, in the making of new temporalities, space-time matterings, new diffraction patterns. And in the related footnote, she suggests, while returning might have the association of reflection, how light returns from where it came once it hits the mirror, returning, as I hope to develop this notion, is about diffracting. The play here between reflection returning and diffraction returning, separated only by the mere mark of a hyphen, is an important reminder that reflection and diffraction are not opposites not mutually exclusive, but rather different optical interactions highlighting different patterns, optics, geometries that often overlap in practice. I began the pursuit of pleasure with a critical commentary that set out my own orientation and aimed for a practice of feminist architectural history. This is what I wrote. A historical understanding of architecture in the city is not adequately framed through one specific and self-contained discipline, architectural history. Rather, it is located in the places where ideas are exchanged about the city between geographers, sociologists, filmmakers, artists, cultural theorists, literary critics, architects, and urban dwellers of all kinds. This interdisciplinary state of knowledge allows new spaces kinds of spaces and alternative modes of interpretation to emerge. It's in this more fluid state, knowing the city is always contingent, forever in flux. Historical epistemology is a complex area. The histories, and I bracket off the HI, um, as, as we did back then, the histories we tell of stories are also histories of ourselves. My interest in architecture and in history is embedded by my fascination with the politics of sexual difference. My position as a feminist makes a difference to the way in which I know. Negotiating a meaningful relation between the personal and the, and the theoretical is central to much feminist work. With myriad feminisms, there can be no single way of knowing the city, but who I am raises important questions about the ways I proceed, about my methodology. Who I am makes a difference to how I read and what I write. It makes a difference to the way I do things, to what and how I can know. And I should add here as a contextualizing note that in the period 1993 to 1998, when I was conducting this research, first for my MA dissertation on the Burlington Arcade, and the late, later for my doctoral work, supervised by Professor Lynn Need at Birkbeck College London, I was also working on a number of co-edited volumes with others, which influenced my thinking on urban theory and practice, on architectural historiography and critical methodology, and on gender and feminism as did the amazing work, the amazing volumes of work on feminism and architecture that appeared in the mid to late 1990s. And this is just a, a very small selection of the incredible flourishing of work that happened in that period. I kind of see today as, a, as another moment, actually, very, very similar to that, but with a very important difference. The first time I read the French feminist psychoanalyst and philosopher Luce Irigaray's essay, Women on the Market, I was overawed. Irigaray's text was a critical and poetic expression of the anger I felt about women's oppression. Her writing fired me, as it has many others. 
For me, women on the market served as a political manifesto, a source of creative inspiration and a theoretical toolkit. I read it in the park, on the bus, in bed. The more I read Irigaray, the more I felt I knew about the way in which space was gendered in 19th century London. Yet, I had not looked at a single piece of primary evidence. I had not entered the British Library, nor even contemplated visiting arch archives. I'm still reading from that book, so, you know, the, the entering of the British Library was quite a big thing back then, whereas now, of course, it's all digital, so there's a a history even in this, a material history even in, in this um, mode of gathering knowledge. So continuing to read from the pursuit of pleasure. Starting with Karl Marx's critique of commodity capitalism, Irigaray argues that women can also be understood as commodities in patriarchal exchange. As a commodity, woman's value resides not in her own being, but in some standard of equivalence. For Irigaray, commerce is an exchange played out through the bodies of women as matter or as sign. For Irigaray, like the commodity in Marxist analysis, the female body as a commodity is divided into two irreconcilable categories. Women are utilitarian objects and bearers of value. They have use value and exchange value. They represent natural value and social value. In Irigaray's symbolic order, women have three positions. The mother, who represents pure use value. The virgin, who represents pure exchange value. And the prostitute, who represents both use and exchange value. Irigaray's work suggests to me a way of thinking about the gendering of space, which is dynamic. Rather than the static binary of the separate spheres, space can be considered gendered through a series of shifting relations of exchange. As men and women traverse space, their positions and pathways vary according to personal, social and cultural desires and to relations of power, class, race, nationality, as well as sex, gender and sexuality. The spatial patterns composed between them, both metaphorically and materially, are choreographies of connection and separation, screening and displaying, moving and containing. Reading women on the market made a significant difference to the way in which I imagined architectural space in early 19th century London might be gendered. The second text that held my attention was Pierce Egan's Life in London from 1820 to 21, an example of an early 19th century ramble. Rambling, as I later describe more fully, can be defined as the pursuit of pleasure or the exploration of urban sites of leisure and entertainment by men. Here, in the pursuit of pleasure, I look briefly at the cartography of the ramble in London overall and then focus on a particular part of the ramble, London St. James, an area bounded by Pall Mall, Piccadilly, St. James Street and the Haymarket. Represented as the most elite, upper class or more precisely aristocratic neighbourhood in London and from the late 18th century onwards a predominantly masculine district, St. James offers a highly specific urban site through which to explore ideas of gender and space. My investigation takes me to a number of architectural spaces, streets, clubs, assembly rooms, opera houses and theatres, all places of upper-class leisure. St James, south of Piccadilly, was a district where there were plenty of places of temporary residence for single men. Bond Street and St James Street have been fashionable shopping streets for men from the 17th century. Activities connected with Parliament were also located in the male spaces of this district in drinking and sporting venues and in the clubs of St. James Street and later Pall Mall. Feels quite strange to be talking about men after um, <laughs> two days where we've really focused on women. Well, here they are. <laughs> Coinciding with the parliamentary season was the London, parliamentary session was the London season which ran from February to July, peaking in May and June. At this time of year, St. James was the focus of upper-class public entertainment and the most prestigious and fashionable places of leisure, such as Almax Assembly Rooms and the Italian Opera House, which is 
featured here. These had been located in the area from the 18th century. But in the 19th century, the area was also developed as a part of John Nash's urban improvements for the west of London, which actually split St. James's off from the uh, theatre district to the east of Covent Garden and today's Soho, um, which was also um, a kind of working class housing area. So this John Nash plan was realised uh, 2012 onwards and Regent Street was created as a luxury shopping district for uh, women as well as men. So this research then is a pursuit of pleasure which works in two directions, from the theoretical to the historical and from the historical to the theoretical. Each chapter demonstrates how different social and gendered relations of moving and looking are emphasised according to the specific configurations of an architectural site. So, pulling back from the text itself, another contextual note, um, the reason I chose to focus on London in these first decades of the 19th century was because this period preceded the entrenchment of the separate spheres ideology in the late 19th century, in the UK at least. And that was something that I think came out of Anna's uh, presentation yesterday, and she spoke to that very kind of eloquently and powerfully um, in response to the situation, certainly in Paris at the time. The development of co commodity capitalism in the leisure spaces of London at this time, so the first two decades of the uh, 19th century, provoked attention in patriarchal capitalism. Women were required to both occupy public spaces as consumers and workers, but also to remain at home as private property. And it's this ambivalence concerning women's place in public life that the ramble expresses, and increasingly, I think, is a kind of um, response to. So... Turn, return, return, thinking um, here about the relation between history and theory on the, on the return. The relation between theory and history continues to fascinate me methodologically. And in the intervening years since writing The Pursuit of Pleasure, I've investigated the importance of transitional spaces in many different ways, conceptually, materially, emotionally, in terms of the space between disciplines, between subjects and objects through the practice of sight writing, and between psychic and material architectures. So returning to the pursuit of pleasure now, I understand the space of relation between history and theory somewhat differently, as a practice, an ongoing practice of situating knowledge, where lived experience offers the potential for generating both embodied, but also conceptual knowledge. Recently, I've been researching the history of feminist life writing, specifically auto-theory, where autobiography itself can operate as a mode of theory. Feminists of colour, such as Gloria Anzaldúa, Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks, generated such an approach in the late 80, nine, sorry, 1980s and early 1990s. In today's return, I'm drawn to the work of Campton Hartman because they create a theory of history and a practice of historical writing out of their own lives and their critical reflections on black and feminist experience. Camp describes how her interest in listening emerged in response to hearing her father hum while grieving the loss of his wife, her mother. If I were to rewrite The Pursuit of Pleasure today, I would develop it as a form of sight writing in which I would include experiences of my own encounter with the archives, architectural sites and historiographical contestations as they exist today, as well as the voices of the historical female figures represented in life in London, such as Corinthian Kate and Sue, um, Harriet Wilson at Almax and the various patronesses, I'll come back to that, African Sal, Mrs. Mace, um, Flash Nancy, Gateway Peg in Olmax, and Madame Vestry at the Drury Lane Theatre. 
And I've been uh, just so inspired by the approaches that all of you have been taking in your work in terms of bringing to voice these uh, female, female lives, despite the, 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 the difficulty in many cases. So I am very inspired to, to kind of do this work now. So on to the second section, listening. Tina Camp describes the approach she develops in listening to images and exercise in counterintuition this way. At the heart of this book is a proposition that is also an intervention, one for which listening to images is at once a description and a method. It designates a method of recalibrating vernacular photographs as quiet quotidian practices that give us access to the effective registers through which these images enunciate alternative accounts of their subjects. It's a method that opens up the radical interpretive possibilities of images in state archives we are most inclined to overlook by engaging with the paradoxical capacity of identity photos to rupture the sovereign gaze of the regimes that created them by refusing the very terms of photographic subjection they were engineered to produce. The choice to listen to rather than to simply look at images is a conscious decision to challenge the equation of vision with knowledge by engaging photography through a sensory register that is critical to black Atlantic cultural formations, sound. In his foundational writings developed in the conceptual framework of the Black Atlantic, Paul Gilroy defines sound and music in particular as a crucial modality of what he calls a politics of transfiguration. His musical transliteration of a sonic politics of transfiguration invites us to attend to the lower frequency through which these transfigurations are made audible and accessible. I theorize sound as an inherently embodied process that registers at multiple levels of the human sensorium. To invoke another counterintuition that serves as the second point of theoretical departure, while it may seem an inherent contradiction in terms, sound need not heard to be perceived. It's a really interesting point, this. I, I don't feel I yet quite understand it. Sound need not be heard to be perceived. Sound can be listened to, and in equally powerful ways, sound can be felt. It both touches and moves people. In the pursuit of pleasure, to set out the gendering of this form of spatial practice between ramblers and Cyprians, I began by defining rambling theoretically and historically. This is what I wrote. The verb to ramble describes incoherent movement, to wander in discourse, spoken or written, to write or talk incoherently without natural sense, a natural sequence of ideas. As a mode of movement, rambling is unrestrained, random and distracted. A walk, formerly an excursion or journey without any definite route or pleasure. In the early 19th century, the verb specifically described the exploration of urban space. Only later was the term rambling associated with planned rural excursions. The rambling genre has its origins in books published from the 16th century onwards. Throughout the 18th century, spy texts focused on stories of criminals, robberies, prostitution and pictures of the seamy side of metropolitan life. At the same time, the term ramble appeared alongside spy. While the earlier spy texts were fascinated with the darker aspects of urban life, such as crime, the ramble was more involved with excitement in the form of fun and pleasure. By the first decades of the 19th century, in Pierce Egan's Life in London, as well as John ba Jonathan Badcott's Real Life in London, William Heath's Fashion and Folly, and Bernard Blackmantle's The English Spy, 
The emphasis had shifted from the earlier texts in significant ways. Unlike the earlier books, which were primarily scripted and included only a few black and white woodcuts, these new rambles were highly visual documents composed of a combination of text and image, with coloured lithographs, engravings and etchings, providing a place where urban dwellers could look and read. Written by Pierce Egan and illustrated by the caricaturists George Cruikshank and Robert Cruikshank, Life in London was one of the most popular rambling texts of the early 19th century. Moving from site to site in the pursuit of pleasure, Life in London describes the rambles of three young males as they explore London in 1821. The three men are Corinthian Com, uh, Tom, a, a young London bachelor, and member of the aristocracy with an inheritance and in London residence, uh, the so-called Corinthian house, he's in, in the middle. Robert Logic, Tom's drinking companion and Oxford student, also with an inheritance, living at the Albany Chambers for Bachelors of Piccadilly. And he's the one somewhat slumped in the chair there after several too many drinks. And then Tom's cousin, Jerry Hawthorne in the green jacket, from the same class background, a fine sportsman and drinker, but represented as somewhat lacking in credibility as a male due to his rural origin. If life in London has any narrative plat, uh, plot, it's of Jerry's initiation into urban lifestyle and manhood. And one thing, just I want to qu very quickly add to this in this Corinthian uh, column frontispiece is this very, very stratified view of class in London, which is very, it's integral to the book, um, this stratified, very, very stratified view. Of, of social class. Much of the amusement and incitement of reading the ramble comes from blurring real and imaginary figures. For example, the three main characters, Tom, Jerry, and Logic, are supposedly modelled on the three creators of the book. Tom represents George Cruikshank, Jerry, Robert Cruikshank, while Robert Logic, Bob Logic, is modelled on Egan the author, and also, at the time, a very uh, famous boxing commentator. Life in London was issued initially as a monthly publication from September 1820, and then these monthly publications were reissued as a book in two editions in 1821, and again in 1823, 1870, and 1904. The book was imitated, translated, and exported to foreign locations. But it was probably, as a theatre production, accessible to those who could not read and with low incomes, that it reached its greatest audience. Activities represented in life in London, such as pugilism, uh, cockfighting, monkey and dog fighting, gambling, and the language used, which was derived from flash, cant, and slang dictionaries and boxing treaties, suggests that the text might have been out of bounds for respectable women. The ramble is also related to the pursuit of specifically sexual pleasure, to go about in search of sex. Ranging and wrangling are terms which closely which describe closely related activities which connected with random movement and sexual pursuit, intriguing with a variety of women. Such words, especially rambling and ranging, featured in the titles of a large number of contemporary magazines concerned with sex. Many of the publishers of these texts had links to pornography, and some produced and authored fake memoirs of prostitutes. While others continued a tradition of publishing lists which described the locations and descriptions of various London prostitutes, such as Harris's list of Covent Garden ladies for 1788. In the ramble, many of the women encountered in the streets and public spaces of the city are represented as highly desirable and described as Cyprians. The word Cyprian is defined as belonging to Cyprus, an island in the eastern Mediterranean, famous in ancient times for the worship of Aphrodite, or Venus, goddess of love, and also as licentious, lewd, and in the 18th and 19th centuries applied to prostitutes. 
In the rambling text, the mothers, daughters, the mothers, daughters and virgins in assembly rooms, such as Almax, as well as the actresses, singers, dancers in theatres and the Italian opera house are represented as Cyprians. And Flash Nancy, Gateway Peg and Black Sal, working class women, discovered by ramblers in life in London, in taverns in the East, and also around Covent Garden, are not referred to as Cyprians, but as Molishers. Listening to Cyprians. In the late 1990s, when I was researching the pursuit of pleasure, there was much theoretical discussion in feminist urban history concerning the relation between representation and experience and between representations of women by women and of women by men. Janet Wolfe, in her 1985 paper, The Invisible Flaneurs, argued that literary and visual texts represent the separate spheres ideology in such a powerful way that the liberating potential of lived experience as a counter-practice is denied or at least obscured. While Elizabeth Wilson, in her 1992 article, The Invisible Flaneur, attempted to establish a positive connection between women and the public realm by reclaiming the city as a space of female enjoyment through literary evidence. And, yeah, just another note on this. So, it, in, in this period, there was a very interesting kind of follow-on to a very um, contested debate in feminism about whether patriarchy or capitalism were the most dominating forms of oppression. There was a, quite a famous essay by um, Heidi Hartman called The Unhappy Marriage of Marxism and Feminism. Um, and there was a kind of turn to um, representation. In fact, one of the key kind of feminists in the period, uh, Michelle Barrett, actually argued that it was time to move from trying to discover the origins of oppression to the representations of oppression. And I actually think this was part of the thinking behind the methodology I adopted in the book, which was this kind of feminist critique of patriarchal forms of representation. In The Pursuit of Pleasure, I drew on Irigaray's understanding of how patriarchy positioned women on the market through the figures of the mother, virgin and prostitute in order to critique the rambles representation, patriarchal representation, of women as commodities. But in returning to the ramble today, such an approach seems to have restricted and perhaps overturned the position of women as commodities exchanged by men. Looking at different forms of historical material would have told the story of these women from a different perspective. For example, women represented as Cyprians in the Ramble and shown in the green room at Drury Lane. So Madame Vestry here. And then this is actually from the English Spy, another Ramble. Um, this is the green room of the Opera House. Um, and I think, actually, these, uh, these figures, um, Mary, Maria Mercandotti and uh, Lies Noble, I think could be approached in a very different way by repositioning them in terms of their own careers. So Madame Vestry was a very famous travesty dancer and actress and also went on to own her own theatre. And... Um, the French Lise Noble and the Spanish Maria Mercandotti are also very accomplished ballerinas in their own right. Following Camp, there's a fascinating potential for tuning into these lives via sound. Life in London included the lyrics to songs and there's a musical score of Corinthian Tom's kind of entry song, which... Uh, a pianist friend of mine recently just sent me a little um, vocal piece to sing to you today, but I think we might, might do it at the end, or, yeah, perhaps, perhaps not the piano for me. Um, but it's quite interesting to actually hear the song. Um, the third, and arguably the most successful stage version, produced under the title Tom and Jerry, or Life in London, opened at the Adelphi Theatre on the 26th of November, 1821, 
when apparently another 10 other stage versions were playing in London at the same time. Written by W.T. Moncrief, with the costumes and scenery designed by the Cruikshank brothers, this stage version, described as a balletta in three acts, contained numerous songs with new words fitted to familiar tunes, dances, as well as more opportunities in the roles for women. However, I wonder if it is possible, let alone ethical, to return Kant's methodological innovations developed in, the re in relation to the history of black social struggle to the ramble. Certainly not without exploring the issue of race in life in London. When I look again at images of the ramblers in All Max or the Holy Land, I wonder how I didn't see the men and women of colour and issues of race right before me. Especially since, in a parallel project, a book I was co-editing at the same time, called Gender, Space and Architecture, I was reading the work of the Combahee River Collective and Bell Hooks. So for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to return to the ramble and listen this time for race. I do so with reference to Sadia Hartman's critical fabulation, a method which resonates for me with feminist figuration, a term coined by Donna Haraway and developed by Rosie, Rosie Brodotti. Um, and actually, as I was mentioning, I think, to, um, to, to people at the start of this conference, um, the, the term for Haraway of feminist figuration actually comes from, if you read it in her Manifesto for Cyborgs, from the reading of women of colour um, and questioning the, what it means to have a place to be able to write. Um, feminist figuration, since the time of pursuit of pleasure, has become core to my sight writing practice because it manages to connect, I think, micro experiential practices to much larger geo-global narratives. So the third and final section, critical fabulation. a term that's come up many, many times in this conference, so it will be very interesting to see where we will take it. In a note on method in her 2019 Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, Intimate Histories of Social Upheaval, Sadia Hartman describes her book like this. Wayward Lives elaborates, augments, transposes and breaks open archival documents so they might yield a richer picture of the social upheaval that transformed black social life in the 20th century. The goal is to understand and experience the world as these young women did, to learn from what they know. I prefer to think of this book as the fugitive text of the wayward, and it is marked by the errantry that it describes. In her earlier 2008 article, Venus in Two Acts, she describes this method as critical fabulation. She writes, the method guiding this writing practice is best described as critical fabulation. Fabula denotes the basic elements of story, the building blocks of the narrative. And this is a much longer quote where she uh, references the work um, of Mika Bal in, in, in more detail on narratology. By playing with and, and rearranging the basic elements of the story, by representing the sequence of events in divergent stories and from contested points of view, I've attempted to jeopardize the status of the event, to displace the received or authorized account, and to imagine what might have happened or might have been said or might have been done. By throwing into crisis what happened when, and by exploiting the transparency of sources as fictions of history, I wanted to make visible the production of disposable lives in the Atlantic slave trade and as well in the discipline of history. To describe the resistance of the object, if only by first imagining it, and to listen for the mutters and oaths and cries of the commodity. The intent of this practice is not to give voice to the slave, but rather to imagine what cannot be verified, a realm of experience which is situated, and Mabel referred to this in her opening uh, talk, between two zones of death, social and corporeal death, 
and to reckon with the precarious lives which are visible only in the moment of their disappearance. It's an impossible writing which attempts to say that which resists being said, since dead girls are unable to speak. It is a history of an unrecoverable past. It's a narrative of what might have been, could have been. It's a history written with and against the archive. And I think we heard this being discussed very eloquently in the, in the last um, round table. So a third return to the pursuit of pleasure. It's in chapter four where I explore the contrast between all Max and all Max, where issues of race almost come to the fore. This is what I wrote. Contrast is an important aspect of rambling, both in the narrative and engravings. Life in London prioritises the diversity of social experience, portraying the paradoxes of city life as the main source of urban pleasure. The experiences of Tom, Jerry and logic are structured around contrast, social and spatial, from high culture to popular culture, from grand interiors to dark streets. The most important contrast represented is between two extremes of London, east and west. So the ramble mainly takes place in St. James's. You can see there, just above the, um, the space of Green Park, across into Covent Garden and Soho, and then there are various scattered moments, maybe a visit to Vauxhall south of the river and a few moments in the city. And then um, the furthest east is actually Olmax, which is um, just um, to the east of the Tower in Lo of London. Come on to that in a moment. In the early decades of the 19th century, the city of London and the eastern districts surrounding it were commercial and industrial zones inhabited by the working classes, including a large number of immigrants, most numerously the Irish, often housed in slums. Such areas, particularly St Giles and East Smithfield, feature in life in London as the places where real life is to be found. And in fact, one of the, the kind of activities or associated with rambling is the idea of slumming it, where upper class men would, would kind of go and slum it, sometimes in disguise in um, poorer parts of the, of the city. The West was populated by members of the upper classes, nobility and wealthy bourgeoisie, who'd moved out of the city, first to Covent Garden and Soho, and then later further west to St. James and Piccadilly. And the consequence of these movements created a considerable degree of social segregation in London between the racially mixed working class East and the whiter upper class West. Egan moves relentlessly between urban, different urban scenes in the manner of an on-the-spot reporter, using rapid language, lively slang terms and sensationalist tactics. The result is the textual creation of a picturesque city, where contrast and juxtaposition operate to create effect and suspend reality. The simultaneous representation of London as both reality and fantasy allows the reader to be excited by certain acceptable aspects of real life, scandal and gossip, but to be comfortably distanced by other more disturbing issues like poverty, crime, prostitution, drunkenness. In this way, Life in London provided an opportunity for readers to experience the urban realm in a form that everyday life, with its class barriers created by elitism and fear, did not allow. It provided its readership with controlled and pleasurable views of the potentially dangerous other. For the rambler, motility, mobility was a critical aspect of his, of his masculinity and public identity. This idea of being able to move across uh, class distinction. And it's most clearly represented in life in London by juxtaposing a scene in Almax, a tavern in the east, and Almax, exclusive assembly rooms in the west. It's always difficult to get the order of these slides because they visit Almax before Almax, but Almax is to the west and Almax is to the east. At Almax assembly rooms 
in King Street, St. James, activities of exchange, consumption and display articulated in relation to courtship and marriage were carefully controlled to produce desirable marriage alliances. In effect, Almax operated as a private club run by a number of female patronesses who controlled entry through subscriptions. And as the most exclusive venue in London, Almax Assembly Rooms was reinforced by its position in the West at the heart of fashionable St. James. By controlling entry to the assembly rooms, the female patronesses took on an important role in managing the exchange of women between men, daughters between husbands, fathers and sons. In rambling texts, such women are represented as mothers or boards in 19th century slang. And in early 19th century prostitution, the mothers who controlled brothels and profited through the exchange of other women as sexual commodities were represented as businesswomen who organised the exchange of goods. At Almax, the marriageable daughters or young virgins were also represented in relation to prostitution and depictions of Cyprians, for example, the well-known courtesan Harriet Wilson. So moving now to the final section. Critical fabulation, African sal. In the pursuit of pleasure, in order to produce an architectural history of a specific area, I only focused my research on the locations visited by the Ramblers in St. James, so not across the whole of London. And following Irigaray, I argue that the ramble represented Almax assembly rooms as a market of women, where mothers controlled the exchange of daughters or virgins represented in the ramble as Cyprians or prostitutes. Yet in returning, I see how Irigaray's patriarchal critique of the exchange of women obscures issues of class, let alone race. And yet, people of colour, and specifically black women, are to be found throughout life in London, most often in venues associated with so-called low life, including the Olympic coffee shop, the Holy Land, and Olmax. Olmax is likely to have been the coach and horses pub run by the Maces, located on Nightingale Avenue, now Thomas More Street, to the east of the Tower of London and on the west side of the London docks. So it's that kind of curvy street that's running north-south north there. The London docks opened for shipping on the 29th of January 1805 and their massive walls, enclosing over 70 acres of buildings, quays and jetties, involved the destruction of existing dwellings. The London Dock Company negotiated a 21-year monopoly to manage all vessels carrying rice, tobacco, wine and brandy, except those from the East and West Indies. And in Life in London, we find Tom and Jerry visiting a wine vault at the docks. And this was, this was not an image that I looked at at all, kind of first time round. Nicholas Draper's 2008 paper, The City of London and Slavery, evidence from the first dock company, 1795 to 1800, shows that money earned from slavery, directly and indirectly, contributed at least a third of the funds required for the building of the London dock. And in George Legg's 2023 paper, Excavating Racial Capitalism in London's West India docks, which are actually to the east of the London docks and were the first docks to be built, he connects the surveillance of the architecture of London's West India docks to that of the plantations in the West Indies. Returning to life in London today, I want to make explicit the economic relations between the slave trade and other forms of imperial commerce, connecting the profits gained by those who occupied the establishments of the West of London, not only to the architectures associated with trade in East London, but to the estates in other parts of the UK and plantations globally. The British trade in slaved African people in enslaved African people ended in 1807 
and the legal condition of slavery was abolished throughout the British Empire in 1833 on the condition that slave owners were compensated by around £20 million. So that's, um, it's been calculated as £16 billion in today's money. So these are the owners that were compensated. In his contribution to slavery in the British country house, Draper uses the records of the Slave Compensation Commission as evidence to provide a national overview of the proportion of slave owners who owned country houses on the British mainland in 1834. Following the compensation money has been an important way of tracking those who profited from slavery. How much of the riches brought by the daughters being exchanged at Almack's came from slavery. Which of the patronesses at Almack's benefited from the slave trade? Using the database of the UCL Slave Ownership Project at the Centre for the Study of Legacies of British Slavery, concerning the patronesses, because we do know their names, so far I've been able to discover that Amelia Stewart, for example, was awarded three hundred and forty five pounds fifteen shillings and three pence related to a claim for a plantation in British Guiana. Foregrounding slavery is key to trade and to the emergence of commodity capitalism in London at the start of the 19th century demands that the tensions at play in patriarchal capitalism that I referred to earlier are understood with respect to race and that the conditions of slavery as the racialized commodification of human subjects are examined alongside prostitution as a gendered form of commodification. Returning... Race seems to be now a vital element of the structuring of the pursuit of pleasure in life in London. And intersecting with gender and class, it's the presence of black people in scenes that indicates the key features of what Egan calls low life and also real life. For Egan, the atmosphere of all Max was all was happiness, everybody free and easy the freedom of expression allowed to the very echo. And the occupants are described as motley indeed. Lascars, blacks, jack tars, coal heavers, dustmen, women of colour, old and young, and a sprinkling of the remnants of once fine girls, all were jigging together. What of the lives of these black people who inhabited these taverns was all happiness. In their short history of black people in London, the Workers' Library note that by 1800, the black population of London was probably around 10,000 from a general population of 9 million. In contrast to the freedom of white Londoners, many black people arrived in London as slaves or came via the army some did become servants, and of those who did finally manage to become free, life was a struggle, ending often in early death. This is made clear if we look at the life of Billy Walters, a black musician who played at the Beggar's Opera, a pub in the Holy Land, today Soho, so named for its large Irish Catholic population, and visited by the Ramblers disguised as beggars. That's the, this image here. You can see Billy Waters there with the violin and feather in his cap. Tony Montague, author of a recent Guardian article, describes that two weeks following his betrayal in Moncrief's theatre version of Life in London as a, quote, disdainful and bullying, ludicrous rogue, the leader of a group of hypocritical beggars, Waters was arrested twice on the same day, charged with begging and collecting crowds in the street and singing immodest songs. He became ill and had to enter the Sir Giles workhouse where he died 10 days later. And actually in, in some of the um, materials around the stage production that I've more recently been looking at, I think there's, the evidence here is, is quite muddled. Some people say that Waters played himself on stage, but actually, and we'll get to it in a moment, um, I think that's not the case. 
uh, Waters was actually portrayed by someone who portrayed clown parts doing what was called uh, blackface or minstrel, minstrel uh, dancing. So what became, and what of all Max, where four different black women and a black child are present, while in other parts of the ramble, where the white women encountered in public are described as Cyprians and represented as flighty birds due to their supposed moral frailty, here the black moles, or ladies in black as they're described, are named African Sal, Black Sal, Aunt Sal, or just Sal. The name seems to be used interchangeably as a black female stereotype to identify them all and given their comic roles, dancing jigs, as a form of caricature. As Sal is a shortened version of Sarah, the name Black Sal may relate to the figure of Aunt Sarah in American representations of slavery, or perhaps to the old English pub game Aunt Sally, where the figurine of an older woman is a stick to critique. However, given the reference to real life in Ramble, it's in the Ramble, it's likely that some of the black women in life in London are based on actual period people from the period, and Sal is mentioned in one history as the wife of the Dostman Bob, who, with whom she's dancing in Almax. The same names, with the exception of Mahogany Mary for the black child, continue in the various stage versions of life in London where, for example, in Brighton, African Sal, Black Sal here, is played by Miss Black. I think that's on here, yeah, as the last um, entry. Um, and in Moncrief's version, she's played by a white man, Mr Sanders, who performed this as a cross-dressing role in blackface or minstrel style, where a white performer would imitate a black person. And given the really um, very important conversation we've just had about whether or not to show demeaning images, I'm actually not sure about whether to show this image. Um, I don't think it is meant to be demeaning, but some people might see it as demeaning. Some people certainly at the time I think read it as, cheer as kind of cheerful. So this is um, an image from the Moncrief theatre version of Life in London of African Sal and Dusty uh, Bob dancing, What um, doing more research into this is most likely to have been called a Negro or African jig. It's described in many accounts as the most memorable aspect of this play and it's likely to have been as most dance historians suggest, and this is something I've only recently been looking into, a creole or hybrid of the Irish jig and the African juba. And there are actually um, ceramic figurines of both Black Sal and Billy Waters um, that people could buy, but actually I did find those quite demeaning and decided not to show them, but that's a interesting question. I ended the pursuit of pleasure by discussing, I'm very close to the end now, by discussing Egan's 1828 sequel, Finished to Life in London, a reprise written as a moralising corrective. Of the three heroes of Life in London, Tom and Logic perish, while Jerry only survives by leaving London and marrying the wholesome Mary Rosebud. Meanwhile, Cyprian Kate, an object of desire in life in London, becomes in Finnish a figure of disgust, deformed through syphilis and alcohol, her life ending in a lodging house brothel. While I explored in the pursuit of pleasure, how the legal system in London sought to control wayward public women through the Disorderly Houses Act of 1754 and the Vagrancy Act of 1824. And interestingly, in Jane's fantastic paper yesterday on the Contagious Diseases Act, I think these acts are kind of precursors to, to that act. Um, so while I looked at how the legal system sought to control public women, wayward public women. When we think of Hartman's critical fabulation, 
She's actually working with the notions of the wayward to strengthen the creative possibility for slipping out of systems of control and categorization. Hartman shows how, despite being punished and confined for her own pursuit of pleasure, the life of Esther, one of the black women she researched, can be understood as an act of resistance. For me, returning to the ramble has meant coming back to the same archival material, but from a different point of view. So challenging my earlier interpretations and requiring, in turn, that I, re that I turn to new primary evidence. Returning to the pursuit of pleasure has meant listening to her, learning from her how to intersect class and gender-based analysis with race. The promise is that by listening to images and by critically fabulating, more can be discovered about the lives of white and black women in 1820s London. Now, this was going to be the end, but there is one very final and quite unexpected um, return um, that I'm just going to, to, um, to share with you. Very, very unexpected. So, in a final and unexpected turn, return perhaps, I travel close, in place, if not time, to Mabel Wilson's early work on Le Corbusier's visit to New York, modern architecture, jazz and Harlem. In researching the African jig, I read Peter P. Reed's book, Rogue Performances, Staging the Underclasses in Early American Theatre Culture and discovered that when Charles Dickens visited New York in 1842, he was taken to a dance hall in the Five Points area of Manhattan called Almax, owned by an African-American called Pete Williams. Here, as Reed describes, Dickens witnessed an energizing and compelling dance by the black performer William Henry Lane, better known as Master Juba. And this is um, an etching from um, Dickens' American Notes. And I'm afraid I don't, I vote because I'm only just coming across this material. I don't have the, the source. I need to find out more about this image. It actually circulates quite a lot, so perhaps people in the room know, know more about it. Given that Moncrief's life in London had been performed at the Park Theatre in New York in 1823, we understand the name of this dance hall as a satirical reference to Egan's Almax, and Reed argues that the dance that Lane led, which is depicted here, an up is an updated version of Dusty Bob and African Sal duet. And this offered Dickens a virtuoso performance of urban black style. If then, as dance historians have suggested, this image is the first performance of TAP. What would it mean for an architectural history of all Max to trace it as a place where a cross-cultural dance may have begun? And further, what would it mean to conduct a feminist and anti-racist architectural history through dance? I'll stop there. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you so much for our wonderful presentation, full of ideas and reflecting a lot in what we've been talking about this last three days. I'm going to open the floor for a couple of questions uh, before we have a rest. Um, anyone uh, in the audience? We have a um, microphone roaming as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask a very general question, uh, uh, which has to do with this movement of return. Mm. And um, as I understood the middle section uh, of your talk, part of the reflection is, of course, is, is how we 
integrates a form of reflexivity and our practice of doing mm. history. Mm -hmm. And I would uh, just like to ask you, I mean, it's almost what it felt like, or what this experience is of returning mm, mm. to something, to, to work that, that you've done 20, uh, yeah. uh, uh, so, some, some time ago, also in terms of your uh, situatedness. Mm. Um, uh, how you, as a historian, uh, uh, experience uh, this movement of uh, returning the soil and, and yeah. digging into something that at one point was a closed chapter and which is now uh, reopened again. Mm, thank you for that lovely question. Yeah, it said, didn't really reflect on that from an experiential perspective, but yes, it, it's kind of, it's slightly odd uh, to return to an earlier version of yourself. Um, I found myself agreeing with some of what I'd written and, you know, the experience when you've written things, you often can't even remember having written them. But surprisingly, I found myself agreeing with some things, but, but not agreeing with others at all. And certainly in that intervening time with many people in the room, many here, talking about the practice of feminist architectural history, I've, you know, been concerned, um, I think Sol and I had long conversations about this, about sort of over-theorising, what it means to, to over-theorise. And I think I was so kind of enamoured by uh, Lucia Garie's work. And I also love pattern making. I love structure. It's the architect in me, can't be got rid of. I love spatial patterning. So this kind of pattern that she has of, the, of these female commodities was very, very compelling. Um, and it's not to say, I mean, I was, you know, I did a lot of archival work. So I'm, you know, I, you know, give myself a bit of a pat back. Yeah, I did do a lot of archival work, but I still think that because I was so, had the theory so much in my head that um, I was too readily um, positioning women in these predetermined positions. And what I find amazing about today's conference and this revisiting of women um, who've been, in, you know, in the 70s it would have been called Hidden from History, but it's being done today with a much more theoretical um, turn, a much more knowing methodology, that I think it's possible to look at women's lives differently. But yes, I mean, certainly I remember the, the moment, that's why I wanted to kind of try and remember the historical moment when when I was writing this, there's a lot of experiences that I'm also remembering about traversing London, the archives, which is something which would be really interesting to bring into it. But I also think in terms of the return and Karen Barrard's hyphenation of that. So in, in Ahmed, she's talking about returning. But Barrad puts the hyphen in in order to make this distinction between reflection as a kind of transparent mirroring and diffraction. And for any of you who've read the, that Barrad paper, it's, you know, some of that Barrad is a beautiful paper, actually, where she goes back to Gloria Anzaldúa's work. But it's, it's, she's a theoretical physicist, so it's quite hard going. Um, but I finally kind of realised through doing this what she was talking about, where diffraction is where the light is actually travelling through material. And so it's going in a different direction, which you can't control. And I think that's exactly in the end. It wasn't what I intended to happen, but by ending with those images today, I realised it was a, reflect, a diffraction and not a reflection, I think. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Oh, yeah, check them. Wait for a second so we can get the microphone, please. Thank you. In which kind of format are you thinking of revisiting this, if you're thinking of revisiting it further? Well, I don't know. Um, I did have a few more sentences that I decided were just so unformed that I would not, not speak them yet. But the dance history side of things um, makes me really interested in a more improvised, and the, the jazz form, as a more improvised writing. So I tend to be quite controlled in my writing. I have quite intricate structures, um, but they kind of 
maybe become quite fixed. So I'm quite interested in the potential of an improvised history and also a more collective writing and responsive writing. Um, I think that would be really interesting. I'd be, I, I'm really fascinated to talk to theatre and dance historians, some of whom I know, to find out more about this. I mean, there's an amazing... Um, professor at Duke, whose YouTube channel I recently tuned into, who's actually performing some of these key moves and saying that to understand dance history, you have to understand it through the body. So, yeah, I'm, I'm actually really excited about what that potential should be, um, how, how, it, how, how one could have this more improvised choreography. I mean, I really noticed this time reading aloud that I use the word choreography as an ambition for how the pursuit of pleasure, what the ramble might be, this choreograph of um, gendered relations through vision and movement. But I think there's, there's not really a sense of improvisation there. And I think there's something really interesting in this um, movement of these dance forms um, as they developed cross-culturally um, that starts to bring in uh, also different architectures. I mean, read recently that the, the Juba dance was actually something that African slaves were forced to do on the Middle Passage as exercise. Um, so I think there's also going to be different architectures which come into play with, the, with maybe the development of this dance form leading. I'm not quite sure, but it feels much more open to me as a possibility. Yeah. Mabel, please, um, if... The microphone. Uh, Mabel, here. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, thank you, Jane, for a really fantastic um, lecture and um, so much to think about and a really amazing return to your work, which is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> it's hard because you were thank thinking you. a whole, you were making, you know, when you do a, a work, you know, you're, you, it's a whole other set of references and constellations of conversations. Mm. And then to return to a work and to sort of think about, it, I mean, that's just, it's a, it's a heavy lift. So thank you. <laughs> thank um, you. And so we have to continue this conversation because <laughs> yes, I think there I are hope. many things, yeah, that, that would be helpful to maybe think about in, in some of the things that, that you're looking at. And, you know, one, one, one thing that might be useful and that also maybe distinguishes Tina Camp's work to some extent from Saidiya mm -hmm. Hartman's work. Um, but I will say there is a chapter in Scenes of Subjection where Saidiya specifically writes about the dancing. Oh, wow. Yeah, where, you know, they were made to dance not for their own pleasure, for yeah. the pleasure of the owner, but also the ability to sell, yeah. right, to show yeah. how fit. And there is a chapter, a okay. section in Scenes of Subjection, specifically on that. Yeah. You know, but Tina would say, you know, she's interested in the frequencies in the sonic mm -hmm. um, as a modality of blackness. Saidiya would argue that blackness is, in fact, the pieza, pieza that blackness is, cannot be dis, uh, um, uh taken away from capitalism, right? Mm, Blackness is yeah. the thing that, that one becomes in the abyss of the slave ship. You know, this is, yeah. you know, when I was yeah. talking about Phyllis Wheatley, that was exact. it's the abyss yeah. of the slave ship that she becomes black and then Phyllis Wheatley. So whoever she was in Senegambia, we don't know. Yeah. Um, so the blackness is produced through captivity. So there's a slightly different register. Yeah. But one book that might be super helpful is um, Hazel Carby's Imperial Intimacies. No, I don't know that one. Yeah, that I'll would be because Hazel, it's a, it's a 20th century text, although it does go back uh, to 17th, 18th, 19th century. Um, but she is specifically writing about, it's autobiographical, um, about her Welsh mining family and her Jamaican uh, family mm -hmm. and how those two th things come together. But she writes a lot about the archive. What does it mean to be in the archive in the colony? And what does it mean to be in the archive in the metropole? Um, but she also talks about the intimacy. So she talks a lot about domestic spaces mm -hmm. um, and her own life in you know, those, 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 those um, kinds of spaces. And so that might be a, a text mythologically that's also helpful. Um, Hazel's also in the group with Tina, Saidia, myself, and all these other people. So these are all conversations we've been having for mm. a number of years. But the last thing I, I, I was thinking of when you yeah. were showing Dusty Bob yeah. um, is to think about 
where the Irish are always positioned, right, in English society. And then, you know, I was like, why the Holy Land? But then when you said, oh, that's where mm -hmm. the Irish are, well, of course. Yeah. You know, and we see this, you know, in Ingalls writing about Manchester, mm -hmm. the poorest part of the city is where the Irish are. You know, and he describes it as an enclosure, you know, and yeah. that is exactly what happened to Ireland. They were planted, right? Yeah. The plantation of Ulster. Mm. So there's a direct connection to the way in which the Irish were dispossessed. They get racialized. They're pagan. They're primitive. Yeah. They're violent. They're, um, so there are interesting parallels, I think, between yeah. the way in which Dusty Bob, Dusty, because he's also blackened, you know, in exactly. the same way, I, I yeah. would say, as Sally. So that might be... Beautiful. Fantastic. That's yeah. super generous. But anyway, Thank I would <laughs> have <laughs> other you. comments of, of the revisiting. I will be that. coming back to you. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, but great. Thank you so Thanks. much. Well, I think that with this fantastic conversation between our two keynote speakers, I think <laughs> is a great place for us to give closure. So I'm going to give it back to the two co chairs of this conference. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Pleasure. Thank you. That was um, fabulous. <laughs> I'm actually a bit, um, um, I don't know, without words right now. <laughs> we'll try. Um, we'll wrap up quickly, don't worry. <laughs> Not much left to say. I think so much has been said. Um, I think it's incredibly generous. I mean, I think Jane's uh, talk encapsulates that now, but everyone here has spoken. This is on, yeah. Um, incredibly generous to, to look back at your own work and take it apart like this. Um, so really, um, at, and, and in such a clever way, and you now raising so many questions. And So thank you. But I think that that's gone through so many presentations, that you know, so, many, so much work was shared that... Um, is, is really, first of all, cutting edge, <laughs> but also um, often quite personal or um, no, just a generous thing to share that with us. So we're very, very grateful um, for that. Um, yeah, so looking back at the call for papers very briefly, we asked what shifts um, if we start from conversations um, rather than, for instance, drawings or buildings. That was, I think, one of the key questions um, that we started with. Um, we wondered how it would affect histories of architecture, cities, and landscapes if these conversations then were inclusive rather than exclusive. And I think we have seen many ways of how to try and start constructing inclusive um, conversations. And you know, when we thought about what the outcome might be from this, um, so apart from the individual richness of papers and project blend, I've heard so many conversations over presentations, and I think there's lots of new connections being made, which is you know, really a joy to see. Um, we, I think the most important things, maybe, or one of the important things is to say that there's no lack of materials, of actors, of sites, of witnesses, of things to investigate. You know, it's, there's no elbows have to get out, territoriality. There's so much to do, more than enough for all of us, um, which, is, which is beautiful. But then there's also something else, maybe, that I think this opening up and that maybe transcends this room and, and our own discipline, this exploration of, of new and, and inclusive methods of going back and looking again, returning, protagonists uh, uh, make visible. What this um, maybe makes what we do also more accessible. So not only are we making, constructing conversations in the past that are more uh, inclusive or accessible, maybe also our work gets more uh, accessible if we, if we listen more um, to other actors um, that are maybe not part of the canon or part of the profession or part of some other elite. Um, and then maybe also become more relevant to the places and societies we live in. So maybe just in a very small way, in a very humble way of thinking about the outcomes of this, humble being ironic, um, way of thinking about the outcomes of this, this conference, maybe, just maybe, there's a little bit that we can contribute to um, by finding these actors with architectural spatial agency where we didn't see any before um, and demonstrating that there are many of them, that there are no rare exceptions, um, or not always rare exceptions. Rare exceptions are also worth pointing out clearly. Um, that maybe this painting, this kind of picture of the past also helps to shape our present and maybe also our, our future. Um, yeah, and I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Agreed, Anna. <laughs> so uh, we could then maybe say that we are 
speaking back as historians, as researchers, as suggested by one of our speakers, from the present in a way, while working with or against the archive. Um, and our aim was to make the stories and conversations come to life again. I think we succeeded. No? So while we were listening in over these three days, our protagonists were also speaking back to us from the convents, the pleasure grounds, the mansions, and of course from their writings. So more specifically, we have meandered now from the printed sites of fictions, reforms, letters, and travelogues to physical sites of urbanities, domesticities, and enclosures, bracketed between Mabel o. Wilson's talk on enslaved poet Phyllis Wheatley and Jane Randall's return to her earlier work on Regency London, as well as listening, in, uh, listening to Zurich Roundtable and online introductions last week. And I think very importantly, in between, we have had some great and extremely inspiring conversations and bringing us and architectural histories further, making us aware, I would say. And for this, we have to thank a lot of people. <laughs> so uh, first of all, both keynote speakers, thank you very much. Uh, all roundtable contributors and Thorsten Lange for chairing it. All speakers, of course, the session chairs, um, the audience for being very critical and very active and participating. A soul, a lot. <laughs> Nikos, Martin, Elena, Noel, Alejandra. And special thanks also to all the student assistants. So Lucas, Lucy, Tiffany, uh, Julien, Miran, uh, Miranda, Philip. Natalie and Jan. And with this, we close, finally, <laughs> listening in the conference and invite all speakers and contributors, as well as the whole organizing team, to join us for an apero riche, and I explained what this means, <laughs> in the Docent and Voyer, which is located on the top floor, so that's the K floor. Just follow the signs, and one last, last time, our student assistants. Thank you very much.